If you will turn in your Bible to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses we're going to look at today is verses 23 through 32. So while you're turning there, I've got a question for you. I wonder if anyone here has trouble remembering anything. <laughs> Please don't ever be surprised if in our future conversations I tell you, I forgot. Because I just simply forget stuff. As a matter of fact, I depend on my wife and my phone for my short-term memory. Because I simply just will not remember things. Uh, but her memory is absolutely incredible. It amazes me, it astounds me at how good her memory is. Because, as you know, Friday was our anniversary, 22 years together. And I bet you, if you were to ask her, hey, where did we eat, where did you all eat for lunch on your sixth day of your honeymoon? She'll tell you what we had for lunch, and she would probably, not kidding, be able to tell you what I had for lunch. She is that good. But even as good as she is, sometimes we just forget things. We do. We just forget things, and we are all, in some ways, forgetful. And we need reminders to remember even important things. We need reminders to remember. So no matter how good our memory is, whether it's good memory or it's a bad memory, as a person who professes to believe in Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, there is one thing that we should never forget. God knows that we all need reminders. So Jesus give us an ordinance, a, a command to observe the Lord's Supper in remembrance of Him. And that's what we're going to do today. So the command to observe the Lord's Supper is a simple answer to the question that we're going to seek to answer today. Why do we celebrate the Lord's Supper? But I really want to go much deeper than that. I want you to walk away today and truly, really deeply understand what the Lord's Supper is and why we do this. Because imagine if God had said, build me some fine cathedral that shall stand as a memorial to me. How many people even now would still be pouring out contributions for that fine cathedral? Some people I'm sure would give their last penny to ensure that that memorial or that, that cathedral would continue growing in size and beauty. And of course being built to honor God it would be one that would be built to last for millennia. And no Christian's bucket list would ever be complete without seeing such a marvelous and astounding architectural masterpiece. But he did not command anything like, build me a building. He said to remember him in this way when he said, only do this. So I want to ask you to stand as we look at our text for today, 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 23. <clears throat> and Paul the Apostle writes, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, says the following, For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup also after the supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But a man must examine himself, and in so doing he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason many among you are weak and sick, and a number sleep. But if we judged ourselves rightly, we would not be judged. But when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord, so that we will not be condemned along with the world. Let us pray. Our gracious Lord, we praise your name. We thank you for this day. Thank you for an opportunity to be in your house. 
Lord, today as we celebrate the freedom that we have in America, we thank you for your goodness. We thank you for your grace. And we recognize that part of that goodness and grace is the recognition that you have blessed this country so. And Lord, as we celebrate and consider Memorial Day tomorrow, we thank you for the incredible and selfless sacrifice of those who have worn the American uniform and given the ultimate sacrifice for our freedom so that today we can stand in freedom and preach your word. Lord, I ask that you would be with this sermon, open the hearts and the minds of the people who are here. Lord, I pray that I would decrease and that you would increase. For this we praise you and thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. So again, the question that we're going to pose today is why do we celebrate and what is the Lord's Supper? In the text that we're going to look at today, there are four points to remember about the Lord's Supper. And the first point is the Lord's Supper is a remembrance of the Lord's death. I would imagine that if I walked into many of your homes, probably all of your homes, chances are I would see several pictures on the wall and maybe on tables of your loved ones, those who you love and are dear to your heart. And that picture means something to you. When you look at that picture, it is obviously not the actual person, but that picture represents someone who is near and dear to your heart. You might could say that that picture that I would see is a symbol, that is a symbol to remind you of the actual person that it represents. But the fact that it is just a picture doesn't change at all how you feel about that person when you look at that picture. Because when you see it and you consider, when you stop to just glance at it, even more than glance, just study that picture, the feelings of the love that you have for that person, the care that you have for that person, the desire to be with them, and remembering the experiences that you had with them are totally and completely real. You reflect back on those when you see that picture. And you're reminded of the experiences you had with them, but then at the same time when you even see that picture, there is an experience of real fellowship and kinship with that person. Our minds become flooded with the reality of that person in whom that picture represents. And just as today as we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we recognize and we believe that the bread and the cup represents the person, Jesus Christ. And as Baptists, we resolutely believe in a symbolic representation of the bread and the cup. We do not believe as Catholics in transubstantiation, that once the bread and the wine are blessed by the priest, the, blood literally, or the, the wine literally becomes the blood of Christ. We do not believe that the bread literally becomes the physical body of Christ. We also do not believe as Lutherans and Episcopalians in consubstantiation where the spirituality is the flesh and the blood of Jesus. Yet the bread and wine are still actually bread and wine. In other words, they believe the actual body and blood exists alongside the bread and the wine. But instead, we resolutely believe that the bread and the juice stand as a symbol. But yet it is even much more than a symbol. It is an experience. One person said that it is much more than a symbol. It is a profound celebration of common spiritual experience. And that common spiritual experience is remembering Jesus' death on the cross. His life and his death was the price that was paid for our sins so that we can be seen as justified and innocent in the eyes of God. Recognizing that all of our sins are washed away and there is no debt owed to God because we have broken his laws. So what is the Lord's Supper? It is a remembrance of the sacrifice of Christ. So in this text, we remember his sacrifice, according to verse 23, through a simple act. There was not an elaborate and grand festival surrounded by a pompous circumstance. Instead, in verse 23, the Lord Jesus in the night in which he was betrayed, he took the bread. Jesus and his disciples sat in a quiet, lonely room, just them, known as the upper room, and he took and broke the bread. 
In verse 24 and 25, Paul tells us that it is also a reminder and a symbol. In verse 24, it says, eat the bread in remembrance of me. There is your reminder. In verse 25, Jesus took the cup and said, drink it to remember me. There is your symbol. In verse 26, we see that the Lord's Supper is a statement of our faith. It says, for whenever you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes back, remembering that he promised he will return. And we must remember what he did for us and that promise he is coming back. So in answering that question, what is the Lord's Supper? We know the celebration of the Lord's Supper is a simple act to remind us as a symbol of the covenant given us as a free gift because of the broken body and the shed blood of Jesus Christ. Verse 24, and when he had given thanks, he broke the bread and said, this is my body, which is for you. Eat it in remembrance of me. So let me connect the dots. So we have the bread and the broken body. The bread represents his flesh. It represents his body. Jesus lived within his human body. So you could say that the body represents his life. And the bread represents Christ's own body. So when it comes to understanding the bread, we remember today and we celebrate his life. We remember the way that he lived that he lived on earth which, with the creation, the creatures that he created. That he was fully human. That he was fully God. He was God in the flesh, according to John 1.14. But we not only celebrate his life, we remember his death. In verse 25, in the same way he took the cup saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Drink it to remember me. So let me connect the dots between the cup and the blood. The cup represents the blood of Jesus. The blood represents his death. The book of Hebrews explains this with much clarity. It explains this a whole lot further. Hebrews 9.22 says, Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Blood must be shed to have any sins forgiven. And we know from the Old Testament all the way back to Exodus chapter 12 where the lambs were to be sacrificed for the atonement of the people. The sacrifice reminded the children of Israel that blood had to be shed for the forgiveness of their sins. But the last time a blood sacrifice had to be made was 2,000 years ago when Jesus died on the cross. And we see this explained so clearly in Hebrews chapter 10 verses 10 through 14. He says, by this will we have been sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily ministering and offering time after time the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. The sacrificing of the lamb was not enough. But he, that is Jesus Christ, offered one sacrifice for sins for all time. In verse 14, for by one offering he has perfected for all time those who are sanctified. This is the very root of the gospel message that we are in sin. And there is nothing we can do to, break, to make ourselves okay with God. Nothing. Isaiah 64 6 said, All of our sins are as, or all of our good deeds are as righteous, all of our good deeds are as filthy rags. Everything we do to earn our salvation is nothing. So God knew from the very foundation of the earth this plan that would have to be put in place for our salvation. Because we have sinned, Jesus is God in the flesh, fully God, fully human, lived a perfect and sinless life so that we could have our sins forgiven. So when he was punished on that cross, all the wrath of God that we deserve was poured out upon him. And what we are to do is to repent of our sins and put our trust in Jesus Christ the way I have described him here. And this is why we remember the Lord's death through communion. And that is the first point to remember about the Lord's Supper. Remember the Lord's death. The second point about the Lord's Supper is that it is a call for unity. It is a call for unity. 
We read about the Lord's Supper here in the book of 1 Corinthians because the church in Corinth was marked and plagued by disunity. They were quarreling with each other. They were mad at each other. They were disgusted with each other. They were irritated. They were aggravated at each other. They were quarreling with each other. Part of it was because they were following different leaders. But no matter what the problem is, it led to different factions within the church, different cliques within the church. It even got to the point that they were suing each other. And Paul is addressing this in his book. They were also arguing over ways and methods of worship. They were arguing over they should eat meat that has been offered to idols. They were arguing over spiritual gifts and how they should be used. They were arguing over the truth of the resurrection. And we see all of these are major items, but minor issues can absolutely have the same effect on a church. And we've got to be careful. So it is a call for unity as we come together. The church of Corinth should have been about taking the, been one body coming together in communion for the Lord's Supper together. But division had gotten them so far apart from each other that they had refused to take, partake the Lord's Supper at the same time and in the same place. So while Paul is instructing the church about some serious issues, like some in the church felt that they were better than the others. I'm a better Christian than you, looking down on others. Some treated the rich differently than they did the poor. Some were even dishonoring the Lord as they went through the motions of the Lord's Supper. And that's why Paul is addressing this in 1 Corinthians 11. And 2,000 years later, as we look at the practical application of this, we are reading this as a warning to churches today. If you take a look in Acts chapter 2 at the beginning of the New Testament church, we saw that it was growing so quickly that people were being saved literally day by day. And multiple times, Luke records that thousands were being saved, sometimes in one day. And now, in less than 20 years later, after the New Testament church had begun, the church at, New at Corinth had begun to turn inward. It became about them. And they had forgotten the very purpose in what they participated in the communion. So through the act that we celebrate today, we are called to remember. That we are called to sit together. Sit down and remember and reflect back on the time when Jesus grasped the hands of his disciples and he looked around at each one of them in the eyes and he said, remember. Remember. So we remember what he has done for us and that we are called to live in unity with each other. The third point to remember about the Lord's Supper is that it is, the Lord's Supper is a call to holy living. The next picture you see is the Australian coat of arms. And it pictures two creatures. One is the emu, which is a flightless bird, and the other one, the other creature is a kangaroo. And these two creatures were chosen for a particular reason, their characteristic that they shared that appealed to the Australian citizens. Both the emu and the kangaroo can move only forward. It cannot move back. Neither one of them can. The emu, emu has a three-toed foot, and that would cause it to fall if it tried to move backwards. And the kangaroo is prevented from moving backwards because it has such a large tail. And those who choose to, tr to follow Jesus Christ become, must live like the emu and the kangaroo, moving only forward and never backward. That is our lifelong goal as believers in Christ, that sanctification process. In Luke chapter 9, verse 62, Jesus said, No one, after putting his hand to the plow and looking back, is fit for the kingdom of God. Can you reflect on what that means? No one is fit for the kingdom of God that looks back. So we've got to be careful and always be looking forward, trying to grow more and more in Christ, having a deeper and deeper relationship with God. We do that through prayer, through Bible reading, and coming together as a church. We have been called, all believers have been called to a very high calling to a holy life that is a reflection of God himself. And that's rather frightening because we know of our sins. We know how we fail. We know how we struggle day to day just to do even a decent job at that. 
But that calling makes us sit back and think that we should never take the Lord's Supper without serious reflection and serious prayer. Because there is a danger, there is a warning given to us for those who participate unworthily. Verse 27. Therefore, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner shall be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. Well, it would be wise to ask then, how can one come to the table unworthily? That's something we all want to answer. So let me give you some ideas. Some ways might be that we're looking, that you are looking at today's observation of the Lord's Supper as just something else that we do in church. It's just a ritual. In other words, our hearts and our minds are elsewhere. We're just participating in it for the sake of participation. One might say that it was just going through the motions without going through the emotions. Another way by, by, is by believing we can receive grace or merit by participation in the Lord's Supper. That by believing it is a way to keep God happy with us or is a way that it has the power to save you or can keep you saved. That is a wrong understanding of the Lord's Supper. And I would venture to guess that probably the two most common issues are coming with a spirit of bitterness or hatred towards another believer or refusing to repent of a sin in which you are stuck. So every time we must participate, we must examine ourselves under the microscope of God's Word through His Spirit. Verse 28 But a man must examine himself, and in so doing, he is to eat of the bread and drink of the cup. We are to give ourselves a thorough self-examination, looking honestly at our hearts for anything that should not be there. So we examine our motives. Why do we do what we do? We examine our attitudes. Our attitudes towards the Lord. Our attitude towards His Holy Word. An attitude towards His people and an attitude towards the communion service itself. And the danger is seen in verses 29 through 30. For he who eats and drinks, eats and drinks judgment to himself, if he does not judge the body rightly. For this reason, many among you are weak and sleep, and a number sleep. Now this is not an eternal condemnation to hell, but judgment and chastisement. Verse 32, but when we are judged, we are disciplined by the Lord so that we will not be condemned along with the world because God chastens or he disciplines those who are his own. And his punishment for those who take this table unworthily may be severe illness or he says weak and sick, even to the point where God would take our life. That's what he is saying and a number sleep if we take this unworthily. But don't be afraid. You can take courage. Verse 31. If we judged ourselves rightly, we should not be judged. This involves true discernment and true reflection on our life. So here in a few minutes, I will give you a few moments If you look at yourself, to look at your life, and to use a strong magnifying glass, God's magnifying glass, taking a deep look at our life, and really consider what our lives look like right now compared to what our lives ought to be. What are you striving for? Maybe we can ask ourselves these questions as we prepare for the meal. Is my life different from the world? Am I hiding anything? Am I the same person in private that I am in public? Is there a sin that I must forsake? Is there an act of obedience I must pick up? The good news is that as long as we are breathing, as long as we have breath in our body, we can move forward to making our lives the way they ought to be with the help of God. That's why he sent the Holy Spirit to reside within us, to convict us. We should never grieve. We should never quench the Holy Spirit. But focus on glorifying him with our life. With his help, we can do it. 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sins, God is faithful 
and righteous to forgive us all of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That is a promise directly from God himself. We can trust that. Which leads us to the fourth and final point to remember is because we have that promise of God that he will forgive us, then we can recognize the Lord's Supper is a look forward for those who are true believers in Jesus Christ. According to verse 26, the Corinthians were to proclaim the Lord's death through the supper until he come again. But we know looking back that the death of Jesus was not the end of the story. The cross led to the death, the burial, and the resurrection and the ascension of Jesus Christ. And he will return again according to God's timing. So in the meantime, when we look at the Lord's Supper, we look forward to His return every time we participate in it. The Lord's Supper reminds us to live today as if this is the day that Jesus is going to return. It reminds us we are to proclaim His death in participation through the Lord's Supper. So let me ask you a question. If indeed Jesus were to return today, will he find you walking closely with him? What I want to do is I want to give you a few minutes. And I want to encourage you before we take the Lord's Supper to make your heart right with God. Truly use the microscope of God's word to look through your heart and ask, what is my motive? What is my attitude? What is my goal? Do I desire to honor God in everything that I think, say, or do? It does not mean that you are perfect. It means your desire is to honor God. I want to ask you to bow your head and close your eyes and pray.